Good day, everyone, and welcome. This is Commander Ray Ford with FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research Small Business and Industry Assistance Program, also known as Cedar SBIA. We're very excited to have you join us today for our presentation, Writing the Indications and Usage Section of Labeling, FDA's New Draft Guidance. The webinar will be posted in its entirety, both video and audio, on our website within five days. And that website is fda.gov forward slash Cedar SBIA webinars. Before we begin, I'd like to cover some details. Slides for today's presentation are available from the right hand side of your screen where the button says Download the Presentation. This activity has been pre approved by RAPS, is eligible for up to one credit toward a participant's RAC recertification. You'll be able to obtain the attendance certificate only upon completion of the survey, which will remain open for two weeks. That means it will close on October 11th. If you don't need the certificate, we would appreciate it if you let us know your comments and feedback via the survey. To outline today's presentation, the webinar in its entirety will run approximately one hour. Our presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Iris Masucci, who joined FDA in 1998 and has been focusing on professional labeling and related policy since 2002. In Cedar's Office of Medical Policy, she serves as the office expert on professional labeling. She leads office ef efforts on the development and implementation of labeling regulations and guidances, working closely with office staff from the Office of New Drugs, the Office of Regulatory Policy, and other offices and centers as needed. So let's begin. Welcome, Dr. Masuji. Thank you, Ray, and good afternoon, everyone. We're fortunate to have attendees from across the U.S. and around the world today, so welcome, everyone, no matter what time of day it is for you. We're excited to bring you this program today to share information and insight on the recently published FDA draft guidance on how to write the indications and usage section of labeling. To review what we'll be discussing today, we will first hear about some general principles to be considered when drafting the indications and usage section of labeling. What information to include in the information and indications and usage section of labeling, when to include limitations of use, and how to write, organize, and format the indications and usage section. You'll see on this slide two acronyms that you'll see throughout the slides. I will be using LOU for limitations of use, and I and you for the indications and usage. I'd like to start by providing some background on what FDA draft guidances are. An FDA draft guidance will represent, when finalized, FDA's current thinking on a given topic. Recommendations in a draft guidance should be viewed just as that, as recommendations unless specific regulatory or statutory requirements are cited. And it's important to understand that FDA draft guidances note the option of proposing alternative approaches to the recommendations in the guidance if that approach satisfies the requirements of any applicable statutes and regulations. Focusing specifically on this draft FDA guidance, the information we'll be hearing about today applies to prescription drugs and biological products that are regulated as drugs. This means the guidance does not apply to over-the-counter drugs or medical devices. This guidance also maintains flexibility in how indications are presented. Throughout the talk today, you'll see numerous examples of how indications can appear in labeling and those are considered merely examples and not all-inclusive. As I mentioned on the last slide, there is flexibility for alternative approaches. And throughout the talk today, you'll hear me regularly recommend communications with FDA staff. It's important to begin by understanding the role of the indications and usage section of labeling, which is to enable healthcare practitioners to readily identify appropriate therapies by clearly communicating the drug's approved indications. So what this really means is do whatever we can to make sure the right drug 
gets to the right patient. And all indications should be written in a manner that is clear, concise, useful, and informative, and to the extent possible, consistent within and across drug and therapeutic classes. Let's talk first about what standards of evidence are needed to support an indication. These standards, standards are governed by regulation. And the regulations state that for drug products, all indications must be supported by substantial evidence of effectiveness based on adequate and well-controlled studies. And for biological products, all indications must be supported by substantial evidence of effectiveness. Let's turn now to some of the general principles to consider when writing the indications and usage section. The first is with, of which is the scope of an indication relative to the population studied. The indications and usage section should clearly communicate the scope of the approved indication. What we mean by that is the population to which the determination of safety and effectiveness is applicable. Again, applicants should routinely discuss the scope of a proposed indication with the applicable review division. We see often that indications may mirror the study population in terms of characteristics such as patient demographics or severity of disease. And what comes to mind for me in this is some of our more straightforward indications um, are very simple in their scope and reflect the studied population, but also uh, indications such as for many oncology drugs, where they very specifically and intentionally reflect the population studied in terms of drugs to be used in combination, the stage of disease for an oncology condition, or the other um, treatments that patients should have tried first. But however, sometimes the scope of an indication can differ from the studied population. So in some cases, FDA may conclude that the available evidence supports approval of an indication that is broader or narrower in scope than the precise population studied. So while there are many times that indications reflect precisely the population studied, there are times when it can be broader or narrower. So let's turn to broader first. An indication for a broader population than was studied may be appropriate after careful consideration of many factors, including things like the generalizability of the evidence. Is the evidence that has been submitted and reviewed applicable to populations beyond those that were studied in the trial? It's also important to look at the consistencies in the disease process across different groups. And by that, we're talking about do we expect, given what we know about the disease, perhaps as it worsens, is there a reason to believe that the disease and the drug would work in a similar manner regardless of the different stages of a condition? And last here, it's important to consider the drug's overall benefits and risks. That's relevant certainly because a drug that has a more complicated safety profile may present a situation where you would be less inclined to go beyond the studied population in granting an indication, whereas a drug, if a drug has a fairly benign safety profile, there may be a little bit more flexibility there to consider. Now, it's actually not that uncommon in routine situations that we actually do broaden our indications. Indications may include patient populations that were absent or specifically excluded from clinical studies supporting approval. Here we're talking about groups such as geriatric patients, pregnant women, or patients taking certain concomitant drugs. So if we are really thinking about it, this is something we actually do fairly routinely, but we don't necessarily recognize it as a broadening of an indication. Let's walk through an example scenario. In this case, there is a trial of evaluating a drug in adults that enrolled patients of a certain age range and excluded patients taking certain concomitant drugs. 
So the study may have been designed to study adult patients, but just happened to enroll patients aged 27 to 52, for example, and excluded patients taking other drugs. The other part of the scenario is that the available evidence does not suggest that the drug would be unsafe or ineffective in adults outside that age range or in those taking the other drugs. So in this scenario, it would be the most typical approach to indicate the drug in the full adult population rather than in the ages studied. It would be kind of unusual and probably wouldn't make sense to indicate a drug in patients aged 27 to 52 just because that's who you studied it in. And unless there's evidence suggesting otherwise, the indication should not exclude use in patients taking the concomitant drugs. Certainly if other drugs are clearly contraindicated for use, that's not the case. But we were talking here in this scenario about drugs that were just excluded from the trial for other reasons. Walking through another example under this framework, in this scenario we have a drug that was studied only in patients with a moderate stage of a disease. And in this scenario, there's reason to believe, based on the factors discussed earlier, things such as the generalizability of the data, consistencies in the disease process, and the drug's overall benefit-risk profile, that the drug would be safe and effective in a broader group of patients with the condition. So in this scenario, an indication covering a broader population may be appropriate meaning although the trial enrolled patients with a moderate form of a disease, there could be consideration given at times, depending on the situation and the data, that the indication could include mild disease patients or even severe disease patients. And in some cases, an indication covering the entire disease population can be considered. And once again, this is all very case by case. These vary depending on the drug, the therapeutic area, the data. And this is another example of when there needs to be conversations with FDA staff about the scope of the indication. Let's turn now to an example of a narrower indication. In this scenario, a randomized trial stratified patients after enrollment and randomization by the presence or absence of a specific genomic marker that was believed that it may have an impact on patient response to the drug. In this scenario, benefit was seen only in patients who had tested positive for the marker. In this case, FDA may conclude that the available evidence supports approval of an indication in a population narrower in scope than the population studied. Returning now to indications that match the study population. As I mentioned, there are certain arenas where there will be a precise match between the two, but there are also circumstances in which some study designs may identify populations in which the benefit outweighs the risks or the only population in which effectiveness is reasonably likely. In such cases, the indication should reflect only the population studied unless and until evidence is available that supports the determination that broader safety and effectiveness can be expected. Examples of these are when prognos prognostic enrichment strategies are used in a trial. An example of this is a trial that enrolls only people with prior myocardial infarction in a study of an antiplatelet drug with another example being predictive enrichment strategies in which a study would enroll only people with a specific genomic marker known to respond to a drug. Now I spoke earlier about the availability that you can consider when generalizing data across adult populations. But here we're talking about pediatric considerations. And that approach is generally not considered appropriate, where you would generalize across pediatric populations or between adult and pediatric populations 
because of a variety of factors, including things like the unique clinical considerations in children, which can include differences between children and adults in how drugs are metabolized, different safety risks between adult and pediatric populations, and the need for different dosing regimens in children, even after things like corrections for weight. We also have to consider statutory requirements related to required pediatric assessments. And here we're talking about things under PREA, which is the Pediatric Research Equity Act, which requires certain pediatric assessments. So for all of the reasons presented so far, talking about the unique considerations in children and when and when it may be appropriate to do some generalizing and when it may not, the guidance recommends that all indications should include age groups. And here are some examples of how that may be presented. An indication can be uh, geared towards adults or pediatric patients X years of age and older or adults and pediatric patients X years of age and older. And as I mentioned, these are examples. There's certainly flexibility in how indications are worded when the age group is presented. There's many more combinations and possibilities than are presented here on this slide. Let's talk for a minute now about other related labeling regulations for indications. We have a regulation about indications or uses must not be implied or suggested in other sections of labeling, if not included in the indication and usage section. However, it's important to note that a related regulation states that FDA may require specific warning about an unapproved use in the warnings and precautions section of labeling if the drug is commonly prescribed for that use and if such use is associated with a clinically significant risk or hazard. And both of these regulations have been in effect for a, for a long time. They actually both predate the 2006 labeling regulation uh, changes. It's also important to remember uh, the regulations about requirements for updating labeling. All labeling, not just the indications and uses section, but all labeling must be updated when new information becomes available that causes the labeling to be inaccurate, false, or misleading. In addition to those parameters, the guidance recommends that application holders should routinely review the indications and usage section to ensure that it reflects current science and to the extent possible maintains consistency within a drug class. And again, the recommendation to discuss any of these, the need for any such updates with FDA staff, recognizing that things like class labeling for a certain group of drugs or for a certain condition does and can evolve over time. So we encourage communication with FDA staff to make sure that an indication meets the current expectations. Moving through our agenda, we're next going to talk about the content and format of the indications and usage section. The section includes the indication itself and, as appropriate, any identified limitations of use. As noted earlier, for many drugs, the indication will be pr pretty straightforward. The indication will be sufficiently conveyed by merely stating the disease or condition being treated, prevented, mitigated, cured, or diagnosed, and, as recommended earlier, the age group. In these circumstances where the indication is fairly straightforward, the endpoints and descriptions of benefit should be summarized in the clinical studies section and are not included in the indications and usage section. There are, however, other scenarios that may warrant inclusion of more information in the indication itself. Some examples are of which are if a drug targets a different aspect 
of a disease. For example, drugs approved for multiple sclerosis are actually approved for different aspects of the disease, be it improving walking or uh, reducing recurrence and exacerbations, or if the endpoints in a certain therapeutic area are not well standardized, such as in heart failure. So let's walk through an example where some of the endpoints and benefits the drug conveys would be conveyed in an indication, using drugs for the treatment of insomnia as an example. In this circumstance, the indication should typically state whether the drug affects sleep onset, sleep maintenance, or both, rather than merely saying the drug is approved for the treatment of insomnia. And doing so will facilitate appropriate prescribing for an individual patient. Another example of when we may be uh, considering including endpoints and indications is for outcome studies. Now, many outcome studies are, are done with an overall effect on composite endpoints. And the example here is for here we have um, when the indication should identify components of the composite, such as a three-component composite of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, and stroke. Now, as I mentioned, the guidance re retains the allowance for flexibility and in indications. So certainly, it's very common in the cardiovascular disease world for indications to identify these components of a composite endpoint. Whereas in other therapeutic areas that still that use composite endpoints, it may not be as, as um, expected to do so. Let's talk for a minute about the guidance recommendations as to information to avoid in indications. It's important to remember that the indications and usage section does not represent a description of data supporting the determination of effectiveness. And sometimes inclusion of such details could suggest short-term use of a drug that is actually indicated for a chronic condition. And here we have an example of that. Something to avoid in an indication would be a statement such as, effectiveness was demonstrated in two 12-week trials in patients with FEV1 less than 60% of predicted. This is the type of information that would be described in the clinical study section rather than the indication itself. With another example of the recommendation against including disease definitions in the indication, such as diagnostic criteria for a condition such as major depressive disorder. So in both of these scenarios, the information here belongs elsewhere in labeling in the clinical studies section, where the indication will be much more streamlined. Now let's talk about the indication itself and how it should be worded and presented. Indications should begin with, drug X is indicated and must include certain elements that are required by regulation. The indication must state that the drug is indicated for a disease, condition, or manifestation of disease or condition, such as symptoms, being treated, prevented, mitigated, cured, or diagnosed. And many of you will recognize this as the hallmark regulation for the indication and usage section of labeling. Among other required elements mentioned in this part of the labeling regulations include other information necessary to describe the approved indication. And we'll walk through a few examples, such as the use of additional descriptors or qualifiers, when to describe the need for adjunctive or concomitant therapies, and when specific tests are needed to identify proper patients. So moving on to the first of these, we're talking about descriptors or qualifiers used in indications that will help refine the scope of the indication. And here's some examples. Patients previously treated with other therapies, such as using 
hormone refractory prostate cancer versus simply prostate cancer, or patients with a certain classification of a disease, such as WHO group 1 pulmonary arterial hypertension, or patients with other important identifying var variables, such as the scenario where a drug is indicated for a condition and to be used only in immunocompetent patients. So let's look at a few examples of this. If you look at this indication, focus first on the type in black, where it says drug X is indicated for the treatment of plaque psoriasis. But you'll see it's not uncommon for an indication to have much more information than that in order to drive prescribing to the right patients. Here in the red type, we have the age group, adult and pediatric patients 12 years of age and older. In green, we have the disease severity, moderate to severe for plaque psoriasis. And in purple, we have an additional descriptor for patients who are candidates for phototherapy or systemic therapy. Our second example, similarly in black, we have the simple drug X is indicated for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. Again, the, the severity in green, moderate to severe active. In red, we have the adult patient age group. And in purple, we have the target of patients who have had an inadequate response to another therapy, meaning the drug should be used second line or in patients who are refractory to another treatment. The regulations also mention the, the requirement to state if a drug should be used in combination with another therapy. The example presented here is an indication that reads, drug X is indicated in adults for the treatment of high-grade malignant glioma, and in red, as an adjunct to surgery and radiation. The regulations also require mention of any tests that are needed for appropriate patient selection. The example indication here is drug X is indicated for the treatment of adult patients with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, and in red, mention of the test, whose tumors are anaplastic lymphoma kinase positive, as detected by an FDA-approved test. Now, it's important to note here that when we're talking about tests, we are not talking about tests used for monitoring safe and effective use. Typically, tests that are used once a patient is on a drug, um, if you're monitoring for efficacy, something like blood levels, that would typically be discussed in the dosage administration section. And if there's recommended monitoring for a safety concern, that typically appears elsewhere in labeling, such as the warnings and precautions section. Here, we're talking specifically about tests needed to identify the appropriate patients for the drug. Let's return now to the discussion and expand a bit on the um, circumstance of when you may include outcomes, endpoints, and benefits in an indication. It's not typically necessary to describe how benefit was measured in the clinical trials, in other words, identifying specific outcomes or endpoints, when the treatment affects a, the broad range of manifestations of a disease. For example, an indication for the relief of symptoms of allergic rhinitis. In some cases, however, a broad disease indication may not be the way to go. So you can consider the need to include outcomes, endpoints, and benefits in the following kinds of scenarios. In clinical trials that evaluated only one or some disease manifestations or if a drug's effect on the overall disease is not well understood. When different drugs have different effects on various manifestations of the diseases, or if the endpoints used are different from your typical effectiveness measures. Here we have an example of an indication that includes an endpoint or outcome. And this, I believe, I mentioned earlier as an example. Drug X is indicated, and here we have in red, to improve walking in adult patients with multiple sclerosis. Uh, 
Again, this would differentiate this product from another drug for multiple sclerosis that had demonstrated a reduction in recurrences or exacerbations. Turning again to outcome studies, the indication may be for such drugs to reduce the risk of significant morbidity and mortality. And including the outcomes and endpoints in the indication describes the de demonstrated benefit more accurately than would an indication for treatment of the condition itself. So let's look at an example to illustrate this point. Here we have an indication that reads, drug X is indicated in red to reduce the risk of non-fatal myocardial infarction, fatal and non-fatal stroke, and revascularization procedures in adult patients with clinically evident coronary heart disease. So here, the intended message is to convey the benefit that the drug provides to patients rather than a, an indication that reads that the drug is indicated for the treatment of coronary heart disease. And as mentioned before, in this case and in all cases, the clinical studies section of labeling will go into much more detail about the study design, the different endpoints, and the results of the composite endpoint and the individual components. Next on our agenda is a discussion of limitations of use and when to consider them for labeling. Limitations of use can be applied when sufficient uncertainty exists about the drug's benefits in certain clinical situations to suggest that it generally should not be used in those settings. Additionally, when the evidence falls short of requiring a contraindication, but suggests that use of the drug may be inadvisable. And among all of these, very important, the last bullet here, when awareness of such information is important for practitioners to ensure the safe and effective use of the drug. So this has to be a piece of information that is deemed so critical that it needs to be presented up front in the indication section for prescribers to ensure that the message gets across. It's important also to keep in mind that most, many, if not most, drugs will not have limitations of use in their indications. So that's why we're talking about the certain circumstances where they may need to be considered. So let's take a minute to distinguish contraindications from limitations of use. On the previous slide, we said a limitation of use can be appropriate when the evidence falls short of requiring a contraindication, but still suggests that use of the drug may be inadvisable. So let's turn to the regulations about contraindications, which says that contraindications are used to describe any situations in which the drug should not be used because the risk of use, such as certain potentially fatal adverse reactions, clearly outweighs any possible therapeutic benefit. So this is really the do not use scenario, which is different from a limitation of use. And the guidance recommends that to avoid redundancy, contraindications should not be restated as limitations of use. So now let's focus on a limitation of use versus incorporating the information into the indication. Limitations of use will most often identify a patient population in which the drug should generally not be used, in other words, discouraging its use. And the intent here is usually to present information and inform about use outside of the indicated population. That's the most typical use of a limitation of use. Whereas information that specifies the patient population in which the drug should be used, in other words, encouraging its use, should, whenever possible, be incorporated directly into the indication. For example, a drug is to be used only after failure of or as an adjunct to another drug or treatment modality. In this case, the indication should include this information itself rather than using a separate limitation of use. 
So as I mentioned, limitations of use can be considered when there's a reasonable concern or uncertainty about effectiveness or safety. And here we have an example. This indication begins, drug X is indicated for the treatment of hypertension in adults and pediatric patients one year of age and older. In this scenario, a limitation of use was also added that reads, in patients younger than one year of age, drug X can adversely affect kidney development. And then you see a cross-reference to other sections of the labeling where that's explained in further detail. So this is the example of the indication is directed at a certain population and the limitation of use is providing information to inform the risk of use outside of that population. Limitations of use can also be helpful for drugs that have dose, duration, or long-term use considerations. And by that we mean how long a drug can and should be used, or if there are concerns with long-term use or long-term toxicities. So in this example, the indication reads, drug X is indicated for the treatment of severe spasticity in adult patients with spinal cord injury, brain injury, or multiple sclerosis. The additional limitation of use reads, prior to implantation of a device for chronic intrathecal infusion of drug X, confirm a positive clinical response to drug X in a screening phase. So this is really presenting a condition that should be met first before the invasive step of implanting an intrathecal device, which is important when, for practitioners, making prescribing decisions on which drug should they should give to a certain patient. So this is different than just presenting the duration of trials, as we talked about earlier. This is concerns about and relevant information about long-term use and how that should be approached. The guidance uh, has a section about how limitations should typically not be used. One of which is limitations of use are generally not appropriate to restate information that's already included in the indication, such as this scenario. If the indication is clearly worded for use in combination with another drug, there's no need for a limitation of use that the subject drug should be used only in combination and not as monotherapy. Another example is limitations of use are typically not used to address an absence of data in populations in which the drug was not studied. The example here, if a drug is approved to reduce the risk of rejection in patients receiving a heart transplant, there should not be a limitation of use about the lack of data on use in lung transplants. Now some products have required or recommended language to be included in the indications and usage section. For example, there's a regulation requiring a statement in the indications and usage section for systemic antibacterial drugs about reducing the, de reducing the development of drug-resistant bacteria. Similarly, other FDA guidances have recommendations for specific wording for the indications and usage section for certain indications. And these can most typically be found in guidances such as our clinical and medical guidances and guidance about labeling for accelerated approval products. And at the end of the presentation, you'll find a link to the web page where all FDA guidances can be found. Let's turn now to some recommendations in the guidance for preferred wording and wording to avoid. The first of which is the issue of using reduce the risk of versus the term prevent. It's generally recommended to use terminology such as reduce the risk of or reduce the incidence of rather than using prevent in an indication. The term prevent is not recommended because it may imply a guarantee of success that is typically not supported by the data. However, there are circumstances in which terms such as prevent or prophylaxis may indeed be appropriate because in a given context, 
These terms are well established and understood by the clinical community. And examples of these uh, of examples of this are terms such as preventive vaccines or drugs that are indicated for post-exposure prophylaxis. The gui guidance also discourages the word only in an indication and says that indications should be worded clearly, making inclusion of the word only unnecessary. In other words, indications need not state drug X is indicated only for something. Because if you think about it, every drug is indicated only for whom it's indicated. Another piece of terminology that guidance discourages use of is also indicated. So when a new indication is added to an existing label, the phrase also indicated should not be used because it may imply a hierarchy among indications, assigning more importance to one or another. The guidance also includes recommend recommendations on how to identify the drug product itself in the indication. If the product is a branded drug, the indication should include the proprietary or trade name. If there is no brand name, the indication should include the non-proprietary name, meaning the established or proper name. So for branded products, there's no need to include both. For branded products, only the proprietary name should be included. And as a quick reminder, the established pharmacological class that appears in indications only appears in the indication section in the highlights of labeling. Let's turn now to formatting for drugs with multiple indications. As I said earlier, there is clearly flexibility in how to approach formatting. And these are merely example options. So for a drug that has more than one indication, one option is to assign a subsection to each indication where you might see subsection 1.1 for disease A and subsection 1.2 for disease B. Another option in this scenario is to use bullets where the indications in usage section will begin, drug X is indicated for, and then disease A and B will be presented on, in a bulleted list. Talking about formatting for limitations of use, they are typically presented separately from the indication under the heading limitations of use, and in most circumstances will be immediately adjacent to the indication itself. However, for drugs that have multiple indications, things are a little bit more complicated. If there's a limitation of use and that limitation applies to all of the indications, it may be preferable to include a separate numbered subsection, such as a 1.3, for the limitations of use rather than repeating the identical language attached to each indication. As I said, there's flexibility here, of course, with the most important take-home message being that it needs to be clear which limitation of which indications to which any limitations of use apply. So to recap what we talked about today, we started by talking about general principles, including assessing the scope of an indication and age groups and in indications. We talked about what information to include, including the level of detail and endpoints. We shared information on when to consider and when limitations of use are appropriate, and how to write, organize, and format the indications and usage section. Just some final thoughts here before we move on to the next portion of our program. It's always important to keep in mind the role of the indications and usage section. Knowing that it's important to clearly convey the uses for which the drug has been shown to be safe and effective, and that indications should always reflect the scientific evidence accurately using terminology that's clinically relevant, scientifically valid, and understandable to practitioners. And again, it's always important to regularly communicate with FDA staff during the investigational application review uh, timelines to make sure that everybody is on the same page about the scope of an indication. So with that, I'm going to conclude the presentation portion of today's program.
I'd like to thank you for your attention and for the questions that have already been submitted. I'll now turn the microphone back over to Ray for information about the question and answer portion of our program while we review the questions received. This is Commander Ray Ford and we'll now transition into our Q&A session. We invite you to continue submitting your questions. We'll begin in a few moments. We are back everyone, and this is the question and answer portion of our program today. We'd like to thank everyone for their very thoughtful questions. We have a lot of people online. We will try to get to as many questions as possible in the next 10 minutes or so. So our first question reads, what is the difference between a limitation of use and a contraindication? Under what circumstances should one, a limitation of use be used rather than a contraindication? So we talked about this briefly in the slides. And probably the best way to think about this is to think about contraindications themselves. Contraindications are used when the risk clearly outweighs any therapeutic benefit. And as I mentioned, a contraindication really means do not use. Whereas, by contrast, a limitation of use is used when there's reasonable concern or uncertainty about a drug's risk-benefit profile that may not rise to the level of a contraindication. So when this information is deemed critical for the prescriber, 
it can be included as a limitation of use in the indications and usage section. But this is, this is done when the evidence is not compelling enough to warrant a do not use statement in a label. And a limitation of use allows for more flexibility for circumstances where the clinical situation may warrant, despite the risk, use in any given patient, thus preserving flexibility for prescribers. Moving next to another question about scope, we have a question here, when is it acceptable to broaden the scope of an indication? And it's important to remember that in certain arenas for certain parameters, again, I'll reiterate that we do this broadening routinely um, for things such as geriatric patients and pregnant women. But really, it's important to always think about those factors I discussed earlier, including how generalizable is the evidence, how consistent is the disease process itself across different groups, and how is the safety profile and the efficacy profile of the drug versus other situations. So really this is, again, a case-by-case -case kind of consideration. Um, this is not necessarily an open door to start throwing all kinds of thing into, things into your proposed indication. It really involves a lot of thorough consideration of all the variables that we discussed, a lot of discussion with FDA staff, and it's, um, as I said, very case by case depending on the scenario that we have. Okay, another question here. Is adding age groups to the indications and usage section new? Well, yes and no. Um, historically, FDA has not commented on the need to include age groups and in indications either way. Um, but clearly, there are you will be able to find approved labeling that's done both ways. You'll find labels, labeling that has age groups in it, and you'll find labeling that does not. But as we were developing this guidance, we really recognized the need for clarity and consistency in this area. It's really important that the indications and usage section is as useful and informative to prescribers as possible, and is crystal clear about the population in which the drug is approved. Now we had talked earlier about broadening indications, generalizing indications, and a certain comfort level that exists when doing that within adult populations. But that comfort level does not exist when you're talking about pediatric patients. So it was really that the age piece is really kind of a different animal than some of the other parameters in which we typically broaden. So just really keep in mind that this, this age group piece is inten intended um, to improve clarity in our indications and to improve consistency. Our next question is, should information about use as second-line therapy be included with the in within the indication or should, be, should it be included as a limitation of use? Typically, information regarding use as second-line therapy or after a patient has failed uh, to derive benefit on a certain treatment should be included directly within the indication for clarity. Um, one thing to think about when you have a drug that's used to be used after a ther another therapy is tried is to think about whether it's most appropriate to actually name the other drug by name or perhaps name the class, the pharmacologic or therapeutic class of the other drug, or if it makes the most sense to say that the drug is indicated in previously treated patients or something similar. Again, the guidance allows for flexibility here, and there are different rationales for all of these different approaches. And really, the same considerations apply when a drug is used in combination with, a dr with another drug. Is it that the other drug should be named explicitly, as is typically done for indications in the oncology world and other therapeutic areas? Or should the drug class be named? Or should it just say something like this drug is indicated for use as part of a combination regimen? All of those different approaches make sense depending on the clinical scenario 
Okay, here we have a question. Should ages be added to indications that are clearly found only in certain populations? Are there any exceptions? For example, is it necessary to include ages for a condition such as Alzheimer's disease? And as recommended in the guidance, we are recommending ages be included for all indications, for consistency and clarity, even for those conditions that are clearly seen uniquely in a particular population. We have an a overarching question here. When will this draft guidance be finalized? That's a good question. Um, our goal here at FDA is to always finalize our guidances in a timely manner. Um, there's certainly a process by which we do that. Every draft guidance is published with an open comment period, typically 60 days, as was done in this case, where interested stakeholders can provide comments. Um, then we assess those comments, review them. We also like to have a certain amount of time to gain experience, both us and regulated industry, to gain experience working under the framework of the guidance. And then, given all that information, we then work to finalize. Okay, another, in, another question here. Where can I find more advice from FDA on labeling? That's an excellent question, and actually, one of the links here that you see on the screen um, is the PLR Requirements for Prescribing Information website. And on that website, there's a wealth of information about labeling. Um, in addition to this indications and usage guidance, you'll find the final PLR rule, all of our labeling regulations, links to all of our labeling guidances, lots of presentations by FDA staff. You'll find labeling templates and tools and lots of other resources and links for FDA information about labeling. Okay, question here. We have a lot of questions on age groups. This one is, can you talk more about age groups and indications, especially if an indication says it's for adult and pediatric patients? What does that mean? Also, what is considered pediatric? Is it age 18 and under? Okay, so lots of, lots of things to unwrap there. Um, if an indication is written for adults and pediatric patients, that would literally mean patients' birth all the way up. Um, we don't have too many of those, but they do exist. So if it says broadly pediatric patients, that would mean all pediatric patients. Um, it's important to note that the labeling regs specifically define pediatric patients as birth through age 16. It's actually not 18. Um, 16 is the the cutoff for pediatric patients for the context of labeling. And I can also point you to our draft pediatric information labeling guidance that goes into a little bit more detail about the different age groups being neonates, infants, children, and adolescents. Um, we now have a question here. Does this guidance apply to drugs, to 503B drugs? Um, 503B drugs represent the compounded drugs. That's kind of uh, one of the newer areas for FDA. I don't pretend to be an expert on that, and I'm not familiar with the expectations of labeling for compounded drugs. Um, but as I mentioned at the top, this guidance does apply to prescription drugs and biological products and not over-the-counter or devices. And I think we have time for one final question here. Um, when should a cross-reference to the clinical study section be included in the indications and usage section? Um, that's a good question. Um, in general, the guidance recommends against cross-referencing in every indication to the clinical study section, because if you keep in mind what the clinical study section is there to do, that's to present the details on the data that supported the determination of safety and effectiveness. So that's where you find that information supporting the indication. So there's really no need to cross-reference because every indication should be supported by the information in clinical studies. And that's, that would really be unnecessary clutter in the indication itself. So with that, our last question, I'm going to turn it over to Ray to wrap things up for today. Thank you, Dr. Masucci, for your very informative and timely talk, and also for responding to the questions that came in. A few closing reminders. This activity has been pre-approved by RAPS, is eligible for up to one credit towards a participant's RACB certification upon full completion.
You'll be able to obtain the attendance certificate only upon completion of the survey, which will remain open for two weeks. Let us know your comments and feedback via the survey. This will help provide us with ideas for future improvements. On behalf of Cedar Small Business and Industry Assistance, we hope that you enjoyed today's presentation and found it helpful. We look forward to your presence at future webinars, which will be advertised on our website at fda.gov forward slash Cedar SBIA webinars. Thank you.